Good evening. I couldn't have been somewhere else because uh, our friend Roshan Kainadi followed up after a personal visit with a few phone calls to my secretary and then some SMSs and I thought if this man can do this for me, he can do a lot more for uh, for this management association and I thought in my very modest way if I can live in the hearts and minds of people of this wonderful city that has hosted me for two years and more, uh, I could circulate some good ideas and less viruses that I'm carrying right now and I'm hoping that my speech will be brief because I would then have a little chance to kind of, you know, allow you to ponder and reflect in your own imagination, in your own thoughts as to if these ideas have any relevance to you and to the association that my friend P. Zakir so wonderfully led. See, two years back when I was here, it was a dismal experience. I told him, why don't I see more women in this room? Why do I see the room so dark? Why don't I see some more engaged audience? Why don't I see things starting on time? All of these and more have changed dramatically in the last couple of years. And I think Zakir should get a bigger hand and a, and a greater credit. <laughs> for making all of this possible. You know, the cynicism around leadership is very deep around the country. I, I travel a lot, not just this country. Can you hear me? Is my voice clear? Not just this country, but around the world, but more so in this country. I was, a while uh, back, I was in New Delhi, sharing forum with the former chief of the army, uh, General Malik. And he had made a very passionate speech around uh, uh, the war in Kargil and how these great uh, war heroes were writing back about their experiences and how they laid their, down their lives for the country and it was no, the audience was moved to tears but I couldn't resist sharing this with General Malik. I said, you know, I can talk to you about a Subedar who was in the border between India and Pakistan and he was entertaining a political leader who had gone there to inspect the border and you know, most politicians go there because the limelight is there. So he was there and he was inspecting a fully automatic weapon, a gun. And he couldn't figure out which side the gun actually fires, which side the nozzle is. So he was asking the Subeda, tell me which side, which side should point towards the enemy. And the Subeda said, sir, it doesn't matter really because whichever side you fire, it's good for the country. <laughs> so the moment you talk about leadership, whether it's the political context or it's the corporate context, the cynicism is very visible. And I'll give you a counter story in case you thought India was all about that. India is a lot more than this. I was recently attending the marriage uh, ceremony of Mr. Narayan Murthy's son, Roshan. And I was in Bangalore. And just to get into that hotel, Lila Palace in Bangalore, it took me roughly one and a half hours drive from my hotel in central Bangalore and after arriving at the hotel after one and a half hours through this traffic I realized that I was behind about 150 people in a queue to meet the bridegroom. The whole thing would take about a few seconds but I'm in a queue and I was cursing myself. I was wondering why I was born in this country. I was wondering why I should be in Bangalore at this point in time. I'm saying what do I have to do with Narayan Murthy's son? You know, this despairing thought, stream of thought started vanishing the moment I saw just 10 people behind me, 10 human beings behind me, the renowned Azim Premji waiting in the same queue. And then Kiran Majumda saw after 20 more people, I said, oh, I'm privileged really, because <laughs> if I can keep Azim Premji waiting behind me for five minutes, I would have achieved my little bit. So what I want to say is that, you know, India is a country, is a land mass where the bovine and the divine coexist where the very best will coexist with the very worst. And that's the beauty of this country. See, wherever you start, you have an opportunity. Wherever you go, there's an opportunity to do something because there's nothing there. And the best of minds are here. 
So when you start this journey and the theme is contributing to nation building by igniting the passion to excel, Roshan was saying, can you give my sp your speech in advance 20 copies to journalists? I said, I don't write my speeches. You see, they have to evolve as we, as we engage with each other. So this engagement with each other as an equal, as a human being, is fundamental to the leadership process, process of excellence. You go to any eating joint in Singapore, you go to any movie hall, you go to any, you know, even those hawkers uh, places where you eat food, the quality is assured, is guaranteed. Because of the Prime Minister of Singapore, you will not be privy to privileges. You see, the man on the street has more or less the same access to basic opportunities that the highest and the mightiest have and that actually is the starting point of recognizing that excellence has become a national identity. Right now excellence is only in some pockets, IIMs, IITs, IIT, Indian Institute of Science, some you know Silicon Valley somewhere, somebody winning a tennis tournament, somebody winning the World Cup. It is sporadic, you know, like fireflies, sporadic. Yet if excellence is sought to be a national identity, it's a national character, then we have to think beyond these individual milestones. I think we, we have to think of a shift in culture, largely. And the shift in culture can only come from a combination of greatness and humility. The moment I say India is, I hear people say India has become world class, it will catch up with uh, mighty Americans, a matter of time, we are great. I mean, this is fine, as, a, as an aspiration, it's fine. But we don't see the real picture of India. Large part of India is uninhabitable. You can't travel in a general compartment in the railways without falling sick. See, I was traveling, I decided that this month I'm not going to travel by a plane. Believe me, the reason I felt sick is because of that decision. I said, I'm not going to travel by a plane and I want to see what it means to travel by train and I was traveling by train. And I can tell you that the India that I see from the plane is very different. From the, from the India that I see in a toilet in a, in, a, in a train. And that India is also India. That India creates perceptions about the country. Unless you are able to deal with that India, unless that India has brought up in some way, we can sit in a seminar hall for hours together, deliberate on data and statistics, have great ideas, it will have no relevance, it will make no sense. Are we there? So how can a land of opportunities like the US meet a land of ideas such as India? My minister was here and she was quoting from some source, I don't know where she was quoting from, saying US is a land of opportunities, India is, uh, is a land of ideas. But I can tell you that India is a land of ideas which has now become a land of opportunities. If you look at what is the problem in terms of converting some of our finest ideas, best of ideas into action. The, the biggest problem, as far as I can see, is that our own mindset, starting from political leadership, and since some people are here with political affiliations, I can say that without absolute mincing words, that the whole mindset of leadership here is narrow competition and eager acquisition. Look at how political uh, character of our political parties are. The moment there is an issue, there will be in a competitive mode to outwit each with each other. See, look at a country where, let's say, George Bush is talk, talking to Obama and there's a major issue before America and they have their differences, but when a decision is taken in the, in the national cause, there are no political, you know, Democrats and, and uh, Republicans don't fight, tear each other out. But here, look at the reality here. The moment you gain power, you get into what is called the Nataraja syndrome, which means we have, my one hand is up, with which I will shake the chair of the other and the other hand down, I will hold on to my own chair. That's my full scale obsession. With that mindset, I don't think any leadership is possible. Maybe survival as a political entity is possible. So if the quality of leadership moves from competitive rivalry to a, an inclusive kind of politics, then all of a sudden you will see the shift in fortunes. Now we can't always depend on our political leaders. The moment a social movement around Lokpal became slightly inclusive, the political power started dreading it. Did you see this? 
the greatest scare in leadership of today is that that my constituency should not get together when there is a no, when there is inclusion in your constituency it is very difficult for for you to get away by dividing the constituency you may gain some advantage but when the constituency unites on a cause corruption is a major cause and i think there is a unity in india across the board that this is an issue and that unity can only be harnessed if the political leadership demands that we include the large segment of our population in issues and include each other so i think the need to acquire something very quickly wealth or power or whatever at the cost of the larger interest is i think the fundamental mindset of you see this in in the railway in the in the traffic in the, on the roads how cars outwit each other in those narrow roads in kerala trying to dash against each other somehow i have to go ahead and then i wait with the with the car behind me in the same junk uh, place where there is a repair going on because the way we have driven on those roads you can see the same restlessness in our societal kind of thing so it's a larger mindset issue and i think india can only go forward when we deal with two fundamental myths about excellence the first mythology is that you know excellence is natural indians are naturally talented nothing can be more stupid than that indians are not naturally talented it is our desperation that makes us grow okay those competitive exams if you see 300000 people taking a test for you know you might you can see the hard work your children put in to be where they are so excellence is a function of 10000 hours of practice believe me i meet a lot of excellent people around the world you look at vishwanathan anand you look at tendulkar look at anybody who has done anything worthwhile a good architect a good chartered accountant a good management professional a good doctor they have put in 10000 hours of practice in minimum if they have gotten anywhere you know it means 3 hours of practice for 10 years in a row and you think you can get excellence on a platter natural leadership will be natural oh it will not be natural leaders have to be grown just as a great charter accountant is grown just as an artist is grown just as a cricket batsman is grown an architect is grown through rigorous discipline through practice constant practice and if that becomes a national hallmark you see i was in singapore and i was having a conversation with the architect of singapore lee kuan yew and he said you know what i am doing now i am actually marking my prime minister and he was the senior minister then he had stepped down from the prime minister's role but he was a minister mentor and he said i am giving him a grade for his english language capability so prime minister gets b plus from his mentor and he said you must improve next time that's how we become what we become leadership is a function of fact practice leadership can't be learnt in a classroom i am can't teach anybody you have to go out there in the workplace and practice and only then excellence will be your and the next mythology about excellence is that high performance producing volume is excellence including children you know producing volume don't create value just create volume that is another problem of india you see the point is that there is no quarrel between volume and value there is no quarrel there is only a priority issue you had to allow an iim to flourish for about 30 years before you created 13 iims now there is a volume iim coming up but i'll tell you the quality of each of these iims will be far superior to any other other kind of institute that you can think of because we took a long time to understand what value creation is so once you create value volume creation will be 